All right. Good morning and welcome to the Ames Public Library virtually for Genealogy Plus, a program brought to you through a partnership with Ames Public Library and the Story County Genealogical Society. I'm Megan Klein Hewitt, Adult Services Manager at Ames Public Library, and we are happy to host this month's Genealogy Plus. Today's presentation is Working for a Living the Government Way with our speaker, Pamela Reine Kerberg. I will be muting your microphones during the session, so please submit any questions you might have via the chat function, which you should find a link to at the bottom of your screen. I'll monitor the chat to make sure your questions get shared with Pamela, uh, but we'll also reserve some time at the end uh, for questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be posted to the Ames Public Library's YouTube channel. If you get bumped out of today's meeting, please just follow the original link to get back to us. I'll be able to let you write in. I will drop a link to the Genealogy Plus page uh, at the Ames Public Library into the chat. That is where you can find uh, our Genealogy Plus brochure, as well as links to register for any forthcoming Genealogy Plus program on that site. So with that, I will pass the microphone to Pamela. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm glad to be talking with you today. Uh, I wish I could be in person talking with you, but as I told Megan, if times were normal, I would not be able to be here. Um, I would be in front of a group of 96 freshmen uh, talking about the end of the 20th century. So since they're doing their lectures asynchronously, I can be with you today. So um, I'm going to be talking about working for a living the government way. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the background to the development of these programs, talking about the contours of the economic disaster, what kind of aid was available to families early on in the Great Depression, talk a little bit about the New Deal and aid, and then talk about the Civilian Conservation Corps, as well as the WPA. I'm going to be relying a little bit more than usual on PowerPoint slides. The reason I'm doing that is I want to make sure that even if you lose your audio or your audio isn't very good, that you'll at least have an idea of what I'm talking about here. Let's start with contours of the economic disaster. The 1930s were horrible times economically for the United States. The depression begins late in 28, although not a whole lot of people notice that it's there. Uh, by the end of 1929, people are taking notice. By 1933, the United States is in the depths of the depression. 1933 is probably the worst year, although 1937 comes close in terms of how bad things were. By 1933, unemployment was at 25%. Uh, the highest unemployment we've probably ever had in the United States. There was also 25% underemployment. And by underemployment, I mean that people who wanted to work full-time were working part-time. People with college degrees were sweeping floors. Uh, people were experiencing pay cuts. Many people who were in the public sector in particular had seen serious pay cuts. If you were a teacher, uh, you might have seen your pay cut by 50 or 75 percent. And there were even a number of places where teachers weren't actually getting paid. What they were getting were IOUs, and they were taking those to the store and exchanging them for cents on the dollar to get what they needed. Um, it was, it was a really difficult, I mean, public sector jobs are usually a safe place in hard times for a lot of people who are barely getting paid for being teachers or for working for the county. Many people were earning next to nothing but weren't counted among the unemployed. If you were a doctor, if you were a dentist, there were a lot of doctors and dentists who were in dire straits because people were either paying them with heads of cabbage or dozens of eggs, or they weren't paying them at all. After all, after the tooth came out, 
there wasn't a whole lot a dentist could do to get their money. Uh, after the baby was born, there wasn't a whole lot the doctor could do to get his money. And so these people weren't counted among the unemployed. Uh, there were people who were running little mom and pop grocery stores who'd always extended credit to their customers who discovered that what they had was a whole bunch of IOUs and no income. Uh, farmers weren't counted among the unemployed, but there were many farmers in Iowa by 1933 who were essentially earning nothing on their corn and hogs. And in fact, farmers would send hogs to Chicago hoping that what they would get back was a, a check for the worth of the animal, but instead what they got was a bill because it cost more to send the animal to market than they were getting back. And so there were plenty of people who were technically employed who were in fact earning nothing. And so conditions were really very bad and they were not going to improve substantially until 1940, 1941, when the United States is gearing up for entry into World War II. In the course of the 1930s, unemployment never went below 15%. So times were, times were very, very hard. Now, if you were experiencing these hard times, if you needed help, it could be a very difficult situation. Uh, there were a lot of people on the move, but as this picture shows you, if you were on the move and asking for aid, you probably weren't going to get it. A lot of communities said, jobless men, keep going. We can't take care of our own. But what were your options at this moment if you needed aid? There was private charity. There was the Red Cross. There was Salvation Army, Volunteers of America, a number of different programs that had some aid. They could perhaps provide some clothes, provide some food, but it became harder and harder to get that help. And a lot of organizations were out of money by 1933 because, of course, they depended on donations and donations dried up. Uh, there were some public works jobs that were made available by federal money. These began under Hoover. They were provided by state and local government, but they were very limited. Uh, the amount of public works employment jobs was very small. There was also relief. That was what welfare was called in the 1930s. It was provided by local government before the New Deal. Um, and it was given out to the worthy poor, and I'll talk in a moment a little bit more about who the worthy poor were. That's an expression from the 1930s. It was very limited. Uh, most communities had a few dollars or maybe not even that much they could give to individual families each week. New York City gave about the maximum, which was about $2.50 a week. But keep in mind that that money was expected to stretch a very long way. $2.50 a week in the 1930s was enough to feed a family of five or six uh, a limited but reasonably healthy diet, but it wasn't enough to pay for rent, for clothing, for medical care, uh, for any kind of uh, emergencies that might come up. And if you were receiving that money, say in a small town, your name would have been published in the paper. This was a time when there was no privacy around receiving welfare. And everybody knew what you weren't allowed to purchase with relief money. You weren't allowed to purchase pop. You weren't allowed to purchase candy or ice cream. You weren't allowed to use electricity to run a radio. You weren't allowed to use a car. And, and people were encouraged to report if their neighbors were doing this kind of thing with their money. Um, so it was very public, very embarrassing, and you had to be very careful about how you spent that money. And many localities were completely out of money by the end of 1932. And so 
uh, there were a lot of communities where the very poor essentially were out of luck prior to March of 1933 when the New Deal began. Now, I mentioned that you often couldn't get aid unless you were part of the worthy poor. Getting aid often involved proving that you weren't just needy, but also worthy. And worthy meant conforming to the moral standards of the community, uh, suffering hardships that couldn't be construed as being your own fault. And so those who were given aid first tended to be respectable widows, respectable disabled people, orphans, uh, someone who had suffered a temporary setback, in, like a, a, a serious injury. Um, if you were a hard working man who didn't drink, who uh, took good care of your family, if you could, then you could be considered part of the worthy poor. Respectability meant that you went to church, that you didn't drink alcohol, that you weren't living outside of conventional morality, you weren't divorced. Um, they supported widows, but they were rather reluctant to support divorced women. Um, and you, of course, you couldn't use your aid for luxury. Another way you proved your worthiness was by using money correctly. And so if you needed aid early in the Great Depression, you had to go essentially face-to-face -face in front of the, the county board. You had to make your case. You had to prove your worthiness. And then you might be granted some very limited aid which would then be published in the newspaper. This of course involved a lot of shame. Many, if most Americans had been believe, raised to believe that anybody who wanted work should be able to find it. And if you couldn't find work, there was something wrong with you. Nothing had prepared Americans for the experience of this depression where you could look and look and look and not find a job. And the result of all of this was really pretty incredible shame. This was particularly true of men who believed that it was their duty to support their families. It was their duty to care for the people in their lives. And if they couldn't do that, they felt an enormous amount of shame. And this made them very resistant to ask for help. It was very difficult for them to walk in and ask for help. And so it was more likely the women in the family, uh, mothers who couldn't stand to watch their children going hungry, who went in to ask for help. Uh, and sometimes they asked for help without even telling their husband what they were doing. Many people never quite got over this whole experience of shame and never got over the whole experience of the Great Depression. That was certainly true of one of my grandfathers who graduated with a degree in engineering from Kansas State University very early in the Depression. It wasn't until 1936 that he was able to find regular employment as an engineer. Uh, they bounced from relief to going back to the farm to temporary work years of, of really serious uncertainty. And he died um, before I really had the chance to remember him in 1965 of a heart attack. And he, and I have no doubt that the constant anxiety he felt from the 1930s onward about money and about budgeting and about fear of losing his job contributed to his, his early death. Um, it was very, very difficult to get past the experience of not being able to care for a family. Now, if you were really seriously down on your luck, I've, I've put a few pictures in here, one of a bread line in New York City, uh, men standing in line to get a little bit of soup, a little bit of bread, uh, because they had no option of finding a job. Uh, here I have a picture of what was called a Hooverville out by the tracks. These were shanty towns 
that grew up at the edges of many American cities during the 1930s, named, of course, after President Hoover, who was wrongly blamed uh, for the Depression. He certainly didn't cause it. Uh, he was not very effective in, in dealing with the problems of the Depression, and that's probably a whole another talk for another day. Uh, he tried, uh, wasn't able to do enough. Uh, and so these were called Hoovervilles, uh, a newspaper on top of someone sleeping uh, in a park on a bench was called a Hoover blanket. A pocket turned inside out was called a Hoover flag. Um, the poor man was blamed for an awful lot that wasn't his fault. And of course, there were a lot of young people, particularly young men, riding the rails during the 1930s. There may have been more than a million uh, young people whose families could no longer afford to take care of them or who didn't want to be a burden to their families. And so they left home and rode the rails looking for whatever help, whatever work they could find. Now, after the election of Franklin Roosevelt in 1932, he of course becomes president in March of 1933. Inauguration was in March in those days. Uh, it ended up being moved because of the Great Depression because nobody wanted as long a lame duck period as there was between the end of 32 and the beginning of 33. But it begins, uh, the New Deal begins in 1933 when Franklin Roosevelt became president. And the hope was through the New Deal that programs for agriculture and industry would restart the economy, that everything would improve quickly, that other kinds of aid would become unnecessary, but that didn't happen. The recovery did not come quickly. As I said, the recovery does not really come until 1940. 1941, and in the meantime, something needs to be done for millions of underemployed and unemployed people. And what comes for the most part is work relief. And I'll be talking about the CCC and the WPA as work relief. There was a vast preference by everybody in government um, from the president on down for work relief putting people to work at minimum wage on various kinds of jobs. There was a real preference to that over what was called in those days, the dole, which was just handing someone a check, just handing someone money. Uh, there were people who the majority believed could be given the dole, uh, widows with children, the disabled, uh, the elderly, but for able-bodied men, and really the emphasis in those days was men, there was a preference to give them work rather than a check because they believed that giving someone a check would undermine their self-sufficiency, undermine their will to work, that it would shame them. So instead you wanted to give them a job. These work programs that were developed under the New Deal were intended to be temporary, not permanent. Um, everybody was surprised they ended up being needed into the early 1940s. And except for programs like the CCC, which were created for the young, all of the government work programs gave preference to men with children. There was far less emphasis on giving work relief to women, even though there were women who needed it. Uh, very little emphasis on giving it to men without children, but they wanted whatever work was available to benefit the largest number of people possible. So they gave it, for the most part, the CCC is an exception and we'll talk about that. Uh, they generally gave it to men with families. But let's talk about the Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, there are, by the way, lots of really good pictures that were taken in the 1930s. This picture was taken in West Virginia of some of the young men who were involved. The CCC uh, was created in 1933. It was one of Franklin Roosevelt's very favorite programs, if not his favorite, because it gave work to young people, but because it also had a purpose to improve the conservation infrastructure throughout the United States. Um, 
Franklin Roosevelt was a big fan of parks and he liked seeing programs that developed the parks within the United States. So that's one purpose of the program is to improve park lands, to improve the infrastructure of the United States. But the other purpose and just as important was to keep young men from competing with older men for jobs. The last thing anybody wanted during the 1930s was for there to be even greater competition for what few jobs there were. Uh, that meant that a lot of young people stayed like high school and college enrollment are actually very high during the 1930s, higher than you might expect. Uh, but there's also programs like the CCC, which were intended to keep 18 to 25 year olds out of the workforce, doing work, keeping skills up, but not competing with adult men for the few jobs that were available in the private sector. Uh, the emphasis here is on young men. There was a women's program, but it was very, very limited. It was sometimes jokingly called the she, she, she program instead of the CCC program. And it was available to a few thousand women basically in the Northeast. It never spread any farther than that. There wasn't a whole lot of emphasis on programs for young women. There were a lot of young women who, who stayed in high school or were in college, uh, but the CCC didn't do a whole lot for young women. If you were enrolling in the CCC, it was because you were a young man whose family was on relief. Your family had to be in need for you to be enrolled in the program. And the monthly pay for the program was $25, but the enrollee only got to keep $5 of it. The other $20 went to their family. And this is very much in the spirit of the day, which said that a young person's earnings belonged to their family and that a young person's efforts belonged to their family. There was no real belief that young people should be able to keep what they themselves earned for themselves. Instead, they were supposed to help their families. So the young person got $5, which actually uh, relative to the costs of the day was not a bad amount of money to have since movies were very inexpensive um, getting popcorn at the movies was very inexpensive, and they didn't have any other expenses. They lived in barracks. They wore uniforms of a sort. Uh, they received their food from the program. So really, their only expenses were entertainment expenses, and some of them were getting to keep more money than their parents would have allowed them to keep anyway. So they got $5. Their parents got $20 and they were helping their families in that way, in addition to working. And I've got a few pictures here of the kinds of work that was done. It was work on projects on public land to improve parks, to improve um, walking trails. It was meant to be conservation work. They planted trees. Um, another picture here from Idaho. Um, I believe they're working on some fencing here. Um, some of them worked on irrigation projects. There were all sorts of conservation program projects and programs within the, sta the states that needed attention. Um, here we have a young man doing surveying in North Carolina. Um, in case you're wondering, the CCC projects in the South were segregated. African-American men were put into different projects than white men. Um, and this is true of virtually all of the New Deal programs in the South. They were segregated. Here are the locations of all of the CCC camps in the United States between 1934 and 1932. You'll notice there were a number of these camps in Iowa, uh, a number of them clustered along uh, the Mississippi River there. Um, 
It was a program that extended all the way across the U.S., more popular in some places than others, uh, but there were a number of projects here in Iowa. And if you're interested in knowing more about the Iowa projects, all you need to do is go to the Iowa DNR webpage where they have a whole section on the Civilian Conservation Corps in Iowa. It was very active here in the state. And one of the interesting things that the Iowa DNR has done has been to interview young men who are involved in the CCC projects here in the state. Uh, there are roughly 150 of these interviews. You can click on them and look at the transcripts. And they, you know, some of them provide lots of information. Some of them don't provide so much. I have here a little selection from an oral history of Leo Alton, who told the DNR about the CCC camp near Council Bluffs and talked about the Council Bluffs program being reclamation, that they were building a lake and a park. Um, and so he talks about the jobs he did, what the people uh, he worked with did, they're, they're interesting interviews. Some of them um, can be a little painful in parts to read. One of the things Leo Alton talked about was uh, some of the bullying that went on in the camp, some of the bullying that happened with one of the young men that he worked with. But even so, uh, they're very interesting interviews and will give you lots of information about what day-to-day -day life was like in the camps, what the various projects were involved in doing, um, what the young men learned. I mean, some of them learned life skills that they went on and used for the rest of their lives while they were involved in the camps, while for others it was just a, a momentary blip and something that was not uh, part of a, a lifetime of, of work. Um, but um, in terms of the CCC in Iowa, 46,000 Iowans were enrolled when the program was disbanded at the beginning of World War II. And then, of course, a lot of the young men went on to fight in World War II. There were 80 different sites around the state where the CCC did work. Um, but the CCC recommends learning more, or the, excuse me, the DNR recommends learning more about Backbone State Park, Beads Lake, Ledges, Lake, Cobby, uh, Lake of Three Fires, Bull Point, Miniwagon, and Lake Wapalo. So there were a number of programs in the state. There were a lot of young men involved in it. And you can travel throughout the state and see the evidence of the CCC there uh, in the very many projects that are still visible uh, that were done during the 1930s. Now, the bigger program, and in fact, the biggest of the uh, work programs was the Works Progress Administration. It was not the first of these sorts of projects, but it was the biggest. It was created in 1935, um, and there were many, uh, many ways people use those initials. Here we have one of them, Work Pays America. I'll talk about some of the others in just a moment. The WPA was created in 1935 as a way of employing the many unemployed in the United States. It lasted until 1941, and at any one moment between 1935 and 1941, on average, there were 2.1 million Americans working for the WPA. It was a remarkably large program, and if you had family members who were on relief in the 1930s, you may discover that one of your family members worked for the WPA. Uh, for me, it was my great grandfather who was in fact a farmer, but he was a farmer in Dust Bowl, Kansas. And because he was in Dust Bowl, Kansas, he was not earning a lot on his farm. So he was working on road projects for the WPA. One of his stories about the hardship 1930s relayed to him, or excuse me, relayed to me by his daughter, my grandmother, 
uh, was of working on a road project uh, deep in the 1930s. And the men would gather every day at lunchtime to sit and eat their lunches and, and just talk. But there was one of the men who would not sit with them. And they thought of him as being antisocial. He just wasn't friendly until my grandfather wandered, great grandfather wandered over one day and took a look and saw what he was eating for lunch. He wasn't sitting with them because he was so embarrassed. He was eating potato peels for lunch. His wife was using the potatoes to feed the children. He was eating potato peels and that was all he had. And he was so embarrassed that he would not sit with the other men. So the other men began each bringing a little bit extra every day to feed him so that he wouldn't feel embarrassed and so he'd have enough to eat and so he could sit with them. Uh, but that was my one of my great grandfather's stories of working for the WPA. The WPA was responsible for the construction or renovation of 110,000 public buildings, 600 airports, more than 500 miles, 500,000 miles of roads, and over 100,000 bridges. The work was meant to be done by hand. And to be inefficient, we think of inefficiency as a bad thing. The WPA did not. They wanted to employ as many people as possible for as long as possible, which meant that on construction projects, there were lots and lots of shovels, but not a lot of backhoes. Uh, when there was sewing to be done, there were lots and lots of needles, but not a lot of sewing machines. They built things better than they needed to be built. And roads were sometimes far wider than they needed to be with a far deeper road bed because they were meant to be inefficient. They were meant to keep men working and sometimes women for as long as possible. And for that reason, it ended up with a somewhat negative image. Uh, the previous poster said WPA stood for work, in, work what was it? Ah. Uh, Work Employs America, Work, uh, I'm sorry. Um, there we go, Work Pays America. Uh, there are people I interviewed who said that the WPA stood for we're probably asleep because the activity looks so slow on WPA sites, but that was deliberate. And like I said, most projects employed men. The emphasis was on employing men with families. But there were some projects meant for women. They were largely sewing rooms uh, where they sewed mattresses for families who were sleeping on the floor, where they sewed layettes for new babies, uh, where they sewed clothes for children who needed them. Uh, there were also a number of school lunch programs where a community would get its first lunchroom, uh, but WPA women would come in and do the cooking using excess government food, uh, government commodities. Uh, so there were a few programs for women, but not a whole lot. The government was also remarkably flexible in the way they defined work. It, they knew that it wasn't just people who wanted to do blue collar jobs who were unemployed. Uh, there were also unemployed writers who became part of the Federal Writers Project. There were unemployed artists who became part of the Federal Arts Project. The, there was a music project. There was a theater project. Uh, the Writers Project produced more than a thousand books. The Art Project was responsible for art in all sorts of places. And I would encourage you the next time you go to the Ames Public Library to look up uh, those murals are part of the Federal Art Project. Um, and so we have the history of corn painted on the wall in the Ames Public Library. Uh, there were also educated young people who they sent south to interview people who had been slaves and record their experiences in slavery. And so we have uh, the Federal Writers Project slave narratives that are one of the most essential resources that historians have about the history of slavery. None of that would have happened 
if there hadn't been the WPA and if it hadn't been relatively flexible. Uh, remember that the American public was a little bit confused about the whole issue of employment, unemployment in the 1930s. And so the WPA had to be sold to the people. And we have here part of one of these pamphlets that explains why we have a WPA job, why we have to work instead, why we have work instead of the dole, and the good that they're doing for the American people. And so this pamphlet explained that there weren't jobs available and that if people wanted to work, sometimes they had to turn to the government. And you know, here's some reasons why we are still looking for work. Business has not yet fully recovered. Machines take our places. Young men and women just coming out of school provide competition. Uh, and it says that these things are beyond people's control. They're trying to mitigate some of the shame that people were feeling. But um, they say that Uncle Sam can let us starve, not in this man's country, or give us the dole. But who wants a handout? Instead, let us work. And it talks about the many ways that the WPA allowed people to work. Uh, here we have a WPA poster, again, showing some of those ways that the government put people to work. Um, in, a, in lunchrooms, uh, building projects of various sorts. And uh, there are some really nice photographs available of WPA. Here we have someone with their paycheck on payday. And here we have a photograph of one of the few projects that did employ women, a sewing room. Uh, you can see here that they're making clothing for families on relief. You can also see from this photograph that it is an integrated WPA project, which means this is not in the South. Southern WPA projects were not integrated and there were separate pay scales for African-Americans and for whites. Um, in the North, the projects were integrated uh, and the wages were usually the same. Uh, here we have some examples of wonderful WPA art uh, where people were doing work and also educating the public. Uh, so for libraries, we have this wonderful WPA library poster, uh, a poster about fighting tuberculosis, another poster about eating fruit and being healthy. These are wonderful works of art that were done by out of work artists that were plastered all over walls across the United States, put up in schools. Uh, and I would encourage you to, to Google WPA art at some point, just so you can see some of the wonderful examples that are out there. Another thing to keep in mind is that the WPA is all around us here in Iowa. I've already mentioned our um, library, or excuse me, our um, post office, which is a WPA building. Our city hall, which was of course, which did start out as Ames High School, was also helped partially funded by the WPA. Uh, here we have a, a small town structure. I had taken my son on a drive and we stopped in Hubbard at the park there. And I looked at the building and I thought, hmm, could that possibly be a WPA building? And I went and looked and sure enough it was. So even in little tiny Hubbard, Iowa, you have evidence of WPA projects that are all around us. The infrastructure of the United States was changed enormously by the WPA. Uh, if you're interested in more information about not just the WPA, but all of the various infrastructure that was created in the 1930s by the New Deal, I would encourage you by, to go to the livingnewdeal.org uh, where they have a website that maps out by state all of the various public works program uh, projects that are out there. Um, they, of course, have a section here on Iowa, which gives pictures and explanations of various projects that are available to be seen here in the state. You can also get involved in the project and upload 
things, um, projects that they don't yet know about. So if you know about some of these wonderful small town projects like the one in Hubbard that uh, perhaps haven't made it onto the list yet, you can get involved and you can also share Iowa's New Deal history uh, with everybody around the globe. So in conclusion, uh, the WPA and the CCC are evident all around us. All you have to do is walk through downtown Ames. All you have to do is go looking at various parks like at Ledges uh, or up at Dolliver, uh, close to Fort Dodge, and you can see the evidence of these programs around us. They played an enormous part in employing the unemployed between 1933 and 1941. And there are many people who you might have known who were involved in these projects. For me, it was my great grandfather. Um, this CCC and WPA history is part of many of our family stories. And I would encourage you uh, to take a look and see if perhaps someone who uh, you may have known or someone who you may not have known in your family uh, was a part of these various projects. Um, you know, the CCC and the WPA completely changed the infrastructure of the United States uh, while also keeping millions of people fed uh, during the 1930s. And if you have any questions about this, I would be more than happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Pamela. Um, I will admit I have been obsessed with the CCC and the WPA for a long time. So uh, <laughs> that was a, a big interest to me. Uh, we did have one question that came through. Uh, what way do you recommend that genealogists access records from this area um, or these programs? Um, Actually, the CCC, there, um, and I'm afraid I don't have the information right in front of me. There is a website where you can access CCC enrollment records. So all you need to do is Google CCC enrollment records, and you can, I believe, for a small fee, find CCC enrollment records. The WPA is a different thing altogether. There is no central registry of uh, WPA enrollees in the same way. And so the best way to find out about what projects might have been happening in a community is to look at local newspapers. And of course, there is that wonderful, huge database of local newspapers, local Iowa newspapers that's available through UNI. And all you have to do is Google Iowa historical newspapers, it'll come up. Um, and then search that individual newspaper to find out if there was a works progress administration project in a community. And you may find stories that list some of the people involved, but unfortunately this is this is one of those things that's harder to research than the CCC because there is no central database. I think because of the huge numbers of people who were involved. Great, thank you. Um, that's great tips on both points. I'm fairly certain that uh, Ancestry does have some of the CCC um, documents. Um, listings. I know that I found some information about a great uncle of mine that worked on one of the projects, and I'm fairly certain I found it on Ancestry. Um, mm -hmm. And you can still yeah, access I think it that is with Ancestry. Your, yeah, and you can still access that with your library card uh, for free outside of the library. They're still offering that access. So, um, so we have a question. Um, it's pretty specific. Was the Alcan Highway a WPA project? My grandfather worked for it in Alaska. Where might I find records for that? Oh boy. Um, I am pretty certain that that was part of, uh, that that was, of course, a federal project. And 
I would suggest going through the State Historical Society in Alaska. Uh, they are going to be able to point a person to the best location of, of records about that. Um, I, that's something I, I don't know a whole lot about, but I bet the State Historical Society in Alaska does. Great, perfect, thank you. Those are all the questions that I have received so far, but if anybody wants to unmute themselves um, to ask a question themselves or throw it into the chat, I'll make sure it gets to Pamela. I also, I'm gonna throw a link to a, um, there is a silent film from the Iowa State uh, Special Library or Special Collections uh, of Ames in 1933. Ooh. It's the, Hoover Bell um, sort of slum area of Ames in 1933. So that oh, wonderful. Thank the context. you. Yeah, you're welcome. Gives you an idea of what our, this looks like in our community um, before these programs. just up Highway 69 um, in Forest City. Um, and we have several projects that were built during this area. And we had a large CCC camp here that was in Pamel Park. And they did a lot of work at the state parks and some of the other typical projects, including uh, we have a WPA post office with murals and some of those things. Um, but we also have an REA uh, funded and built power plant that was constructed in 1939. And I haven't been able to find anything locally um, that would suggest that it was some of that WPA labor might have been used for that REA project. And I was wondering if there's some interrelation between um, kind of those other types of New Deal projects and maybe uh, some of these things that we commonly think of as CCC or WPA projects. That's you, Kevin, isn't it? It is me. Okay. <laughs> Kevin was one of my students. Um, there is a lot of overlap in projects. Um, and what jurisdictions would sometimes do is uh, use funding from one program for uh, parts of a project and then layer on labor from another project. And I'm afraid that one's gonna be really difficult to tease out. You would probably have to uh, look through the local paper and see if there's there's a if discussions of those two projects coincide um i'm afraid that there's no easier way than just wading through the local paper and seeing if the coverage overlaps and if the coverage mentions that because a lot of this was done on a very ad hoc basis and it can be difficult, really difficult to tease out who was doing what. So I'm afraid I can't be any more specific than that. Okay, and we did have a question about the newspaper resource, just to confirm that the University of Northern Iowa, Iowa historical newspapers that you were referencing earlier. Right, and I forget the exact name of the database, I'm sorry. Uh, but if you Google uh, Iowa Historic Newspapers, and then there will be a link that says Iowa Historic Newspapers by County. And it is a resource through the Rod Library uh, at UNI. It's completely free. It is a huge collection of newspapers, a wonderful resource where you can find all kinds. I mean, they're not all there, but there's an awful lot of small town newspapers there. And they run from the 1850s, 1860s, right up to almost the present in some cases. So it's a wonderful, wonderful collection and really useful. It can be word searched. It can also be searched by date. And so you can find all kinds of great things in there, including, you know, 
Googling your great grandma in the town where she lived and finding uh, the comments about, you know, her playing in the the six on six basketball tournament or her wedding announcement or her sending in a recipe. Uh, so there's all kinds of good information there. Yeah, this is great. I was not aware of this resource. Uh, Kevin threw a link into the chat so you all can find it. Oh, there. good. Um, yes, it's, it, it's wonderful. Yeah, it, I appreciate that it really aggregates all of the different resources out there um, for Iowa newspapers. So you don't have to search. And some of the some places. of these are little tiny newspapers that were only published once a week in small places that lost their newspapers long ago. Um, and there are also, I believe, some student newspapers in there too. Oh, great. So yeah, it's great stuff. All right, any other questions to pass along or comments? Okay, I don't see anything coming up in chat and I don't see anybody unmuting themselves. Megan? Yes, hi Dick. Sorry, I was a little, sorry, I was a little bit late there. But um, I do have a question about uh, in uh, uh, Pamela, in one of your, your uh, uh, PowerPoint presentations there, one screen showed a uh, picture of the Alden Bridge. Oh yes, I think you were giving you were giving an example of a place to search for more information. Yes. Yes. Um, it's a not website the called the Nineteen Thirties Bridge, but I've been across that bridge many times. Um, where do I go to find out more information about that and other other things in the state of Iowa? Yes. Um, Okay, deal? here is the, yes, the live, the website is the Living New Deal, and I've got, I've got the web address right here for you. Okay. And gotcha. it lists the projects by state. And if you know of projects that aren't included, you can upload information. So uh, I would encourage any of you who, you know, have, have seen something and it's not listed there to you know put on your your historian hat find out what information you can take a picture and upload it to the website it's a really fun website oh and fun websites um, if you're interested in the farm security administration photographs from the 1960s 1930s, and there are all kinds of photographs from, from counties all over the state. There is a website called Photogrammer that is um, managed by, it's managed by Yale, and, and you can search that site and find wonderful, wonderful pictures uh, from all over Iowa. Uh, and so uh, that one might be one for Megan to put up as well. Now, Megan, you put up photogrammer.yale. Is that at Yale University? Okay. Thank you. Not meeting again next month. No presentation uh, in December, as usual. Um, so. so have a great day, everybody.